<laughs> so welcome everybody to uh, our online gardening workshop uh, and thank you for coming. My name is Kashka and I'm a blog and carbon conversation coordinator at PLANT uh, at Tapeport Community uh, Trust, uh, which runs Tapeport Community Garden related project, projects and we, uh, we are currently funded uh, through Climate Challenge Fund. Uh, and we are hosting this session today. Um, before uh, we start, I would like to uh, let you know a little bit more about this, these online gardening workshops. It's a series we started in lockdown, which is a collaboration between several um, um, gardening enthusiasts in the, in the region, uh, which include Nine Wells Community Garden, Strathkinis Community Garden, Edible Campus, uh, St Andrews, um, Yellow Wellies Gardening, and uh, Tapeport Community Garden, which is us. So welcome to this uh, wonderful online adventure in growing. And today we are talking about permaculture and Carol is here to tell us all about it. Um, and I'll let you uh, introduce yourself maybe and uh, if you can take over from here. Sure. So my name is Carol, obviously, um, and I first discovered permaculture seven or eight years ago through the transition network in the PhD. And it's a bit of a light bulb moment because I've been interested in environmental things for a very long time since I was a teenager, you know, and how we can make the, the, the planet a, a cleaner place. But I never really found anything that had practical application where I could do that. Um, and I discovered a permaculture magazine and then went on a permaculture introduction course. And it's a bit of a light bulb moment because suddenly there was lots of practical, sensible, scientific things you could do to make your life much more energy efficient and easier. Um, and have fun in the process and you didn't necessarily have to wear a, a horse hair shirt or um, eat lentils and walk around barefoot if you didn't want to. So um, I'm in the middle of doing my diploma, in fact I'm not in the middle, I'm already nearly finished doing my permaculture diploma and I teach permaculture with James Chapman in Edinburgh um, and I run my, I've got my own site here in Aberdour, we have a five acre site that we bought, we moved here four years ago and we're now converting that into a permaculture demonstration site. And so Casca has asked me along to share some tips for working more at a garden scale um, rather than a five acre scale. And um, so that's what I'm going to do today. And my background before I sort of get into this was I'm a research scientist. So I worked for BP and Procter and Gamble, and I now work for a company called Living Water, and we use plants and wetland systems to treat pollution. So we take natural, so that natural living things and the get rid of all the nasty man-made things that we keep putting into the into the planet. So I combine research with permaculture and growing. Okay. You're on mute now, Kaskin, right. Yes, <laughs> well, uh, right. So, uh, yeah, if you can you can start your presentation whenever you're ready. So if you can just screen, screen share. Right, here we are. So see, I'm, I'm a scientist and I do, my favourite scientist is Albert Einstein because he has such a, a good understanding that, you know, science is one thing, but we're still part of nature, you know, and, and our task is to be to free ourselves from, by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty. We can't separate ourselves from, from nature and the world around us, you know. We sometimes think that nature is a separate thing that we control, but we're really just part of it. Oh, are you not? There we go. Um, I don't know how many people have heard about permaculture. Um, we can have lots of questions at the end, but uh, a simple explanation. Permaculture was created by two Australian guys called Bill Mullinson and David Holmgren. Um, and permaculture is like a contraction of the words permanent and agriculture. And it's really a design system um, based on three ethics. It's the only design system ever based on ethics. And the three ethics of permaculture are earth care, people care, and fair share. So it's a very equitable system. And it's all about designing things to make it as energy efficient and as easy as possible and to work with nature rather than against it. Um, and so, you know, these guys work in big scales and you can watch permaculture videos online and you'll see people converting like thousand acre farms using regenerative agriculture. But we also, you, you can apply permaculture to how you run an organization, to how, how your health is, 
how to, how you manage your garden. And today we'll talk about gardening. So for me, permaculture gardening is a combination of design and how you design your garden. And then lots of methods and techniques you use to pick the soil. And that way you're getting the maximum yield out of your garden for the minimum inputs. Basically it's lazy gardening. I'm very lazy and I like lazy gardening. Um, so it's, it's a toolbox, a design toolbox. There's lots of tools you can use and I guess that the skill is deciding which tool is applicable for your site. Um, you know, we look at the scale of permanence, so if things that are going to be on the site a very long time we would give priority and then things that are temporary you can move around, you can decide where to put them later on. Um, we look a lot at food forests, forest gardening, we you know, look at how we can ergonomically put things together. And before I got, so I'm going to research scientist, I'm also um, a qualified um, ergonomist, so I have a human factors master's, which is all about designing things for being for ergonomics. And when people used to not know what ergonomics was either, as much as you wouldn't know what permaculture was. Um, and if you think about your car, you know, and if you're sitting in your car, the items you use the most are on the steering wheel so that you don't have to stretch too far to access them. So things like the indicators, the radio controls and the lights and the wipers, they are usually all on the steering wheel and you can normally move them all with your fingers. Things that you don't need as often, you need in your journey but you don't need to use all the time while you're driving. You have them in the glove box, they're further away. Things you hardly ever use but you want to have for an emergency, like your spare tyre and your jack and your pump and your jump leads, they're in the boot of the car. And things like spare parts, they'll be in your garage or your shed. And that's kind of a, an ergonomic design where the things you need most are right at your fingertips so that you can use them. And we apply that in permaculture as part of our permaculture design. It's basically what I, I would say it's, to say it's ergonomics, where you know the people live in the house, they're zone zero, zero, your house is zone zero. And then the things that you visit the most often, the things that you want to use the most often, like you know, if you make mint tea, so your herbs, your salads, you know, the things that you want to cook in your garden and your kitchen all the time, you want as close to the house as possible. And we have something in permaculture called the fluffy slipper test. So you can go out in your garden and get what you need for dinner without getting your slippers wet. Then you've designed it properly. Um, so those things would be in zone one immediately outside your house. Um, then you've got um, semi-intensely cultivated. So things like maybe you've got um, fruit trees. Well, you don't need to harvest them or prune them or weed them every day. And they can be a bit further away. Um, you get on sort of like wild foods and, and pasture. So the things that you only need, maybe need to visit once or twice a year, they're furthest away from your house. And the things that you want to eat on a daily basis are closest. Here we go. Um, so when we apply that, this is this is a picture of my field. Um, we moved in here four years ago and it's just a big grass field with lots of paddocks. You can see the house hopefully down at the bottom, which is like zone zero on the right hand side. And we've got like a family garden. So around about zone zero and zone one is where I grow lots of herbs, because I drink lots of herb tea. I have lots of mints right outside the back door and kale and salad and things. And it's also where my son plays most of the time. So that's zone one, it's where we park the car. I have a market garden, which I go to several times a week. It's not necessarily needs to be there every day. That's zone two, it's a bit further away. I have a research station where I do my work with living water and that's further away again. I'm only there maybe twice a week. And then we have a forest garden, which with the good thing about forest gardens, they don't need as much maintenance. It's mainly all perennials and that's further away again. Um, because once it's established, I just go to harvest stuff. Um, I don't necessarily need to be there weeding and planting every day. Um, so it basically it's been applying permaculture to design how you lay things out. And this is like the broad brush stuff, and then obviously you get into the smaller detail, but it's all the same thing. What interacts with what? What was best with what? Um, and that's how we do a bit of design. Um, so this is like a little bit more of a, a normal size garden here. And it just shows you, I have tried to maximize the synergy between different items in our garden. So this was like how my market garden used to be. And you can see we used to have chickens in the middle. And I would take any weeds that I found and I would throw them into the chickens. And the chickens would scratch them around and shred it into nice little pieces. They would fertilize all of that with their, with their poo. And they would also eat all the seeds. So by the time all of this lot went into my compost heap, it was seed free and it had been broken down into lots of little pieces. And it was well fertilized and it would make the compost go like rocket fuel. 
So the chickens were doing all the work for me. And that's another permaculture principle that everything gardens. If you can find out the job that it's doing, then you use it. Um, and the compost heap's located next to the chickens. It's located close to the polytunnel. It's located close to the, the vegetable beds so that I can take all the stuff I need into the chickens. It goes from chickens to the compost and then back out again. So I'm not walking from one end of the garden to the other. Because um, I can say I'm a bit lazy. I want everything to be as close and as well organized as possible. Um, the other nice thing about the chickens, these are all the different interactions here. So you can see that I always have a little pond nearby because the pond attracts frogs and toads and hedgehogs. They like a drink and they're very good at eating slugs and snails. So they're gardening. They're my pest control in the garden. Um, my tools are nearby. I've got a couple of tool sheds and they all have water catchment on them. And then there's little pipes, little hoses that run from the bottom of the water butts into the beds so that I can just open a tap and they irrigate themselves. I don't have to stand around and water everything. I like to do as little as possible in the garden rather than harvest stuff and eat stuff. Um, and we have a little swale at the top and that's just to try and again catch as much water as we can so that I have to do the least watering as I can. Um, so it's all about synergies and optimization and just capturing the energy. So that was a, a, just a little bit about design. We do run design courses which is um, called a permaculture design course and that's a it runs over six weekends. We're running an online one shortly um, to look up non-stuff um, non industries. So because it's a 20 minute session, that's a tiny little bit about permaculture design just to put your appetite. I think things that you can apply in your own garden from today are a lot of the methods and the techniques we use in permaculture. And we don't, it's funny, we don't farm, we don't, we see, we don't, we don't feed our plants, we don't, we don't grow plants, we really sort of farm worms and we, we, we feed our soil in permaculture and, and it's really important to understand why so I'm going to take you through this soil food web and this was devised by a woman called Elaine Ingham um, and you can watch her videos on YouTube as well because and this is this is why farming conventional farming doesn't work because they don't understand this soil food web so if you imagine you have your plants and you've got all the green leaves and shoots at the top and you've got your roots underneath. And plants are basically just solar panels. So they, they take in the CO2 from the air and they use the energy from the sun to convert that into carbohydrates. And they obviously they release oxygen to the air. Now the carbohydrates come down and it comes out through these roots into the soil. It's called exudates because they, they can excrete carbohydrates and sugars and starches into the soil and what happens is we have fungi and mycorrhizal fungi is kind of fungi under the soil and it bonds with the roots of the plants and it kind of and then what happens is so you get the fungi will bond with the roots of the plants and you also get bacteria and the fungi and the bacteria they consume the, the carbohydrates that the roots of the plants are giving out and then what happens is you get nematodes. Well, the nematodes will sometimes eat the roots as well. And also any organic matter. So, you know, if they're, um, they're not evergreen plants, the leaf fall will come off and that will lie on the soil. So as well as the, the, the carbohydrates and the sugars that the plants are giving off through the roots, we also got waste organic matter coming from the plants. And the bacteria and the fungi also eat all that detritus. Um, and they convert that. So they basically have all these nutrients inside the bacteria and the fungi and the nematodes and then you get bigger things that come along and eat them so you get protozoa you get amoeba and flagellates and you get bigger nematodes and you get arthropods it's basically when you get to things that are the size that we can actually see and then you get bigger arthropods so bigger beetles and spiders and worms because nematodes are basically just worms but all in different shapes and sizes and then obviously the birds come along and they eat the beetles and they eat the worms and the mammals come along and all these things, they come along and they eat the fungi and the bacteria. And they excrete the nutrient in a form that the plants can take up. Because the plants, all the minerals that are in the soil, the plant doesn't access those, it can't access those. It access those. They have a, a beneficial reaction, um, a beneficial relationship with the fungi and the bacteria. So they can't access the nutrients 
until the fungi and the bacteria actually mine it from the soil and the, all these other animals excrete it into the soil and then they put that back into the plants. So when you go to farms and they just pour on solutions of NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, a lot of that's not accessible to the plants and it just washes off down into the water course. Whereas if you feed the biology, biology will mine the nutrients out of the soil and feed it back into the plants. And then the plants are getting a really nice um, varied diet because they're getting a whole lot of different things. Whereas if you just feed them fertilizer, you're essentially just asking them to live on vitamin tablets. So you're missing out a lot of minerals and trace minerals. So it's really important to understand that you want to feed the soil and not necessarily the plants. And this is an example of a farm on the left hand side where they have applied um, compost teas and they are really concentrating on the biology and making sure that they're not killing the biology and the one on the right is your conventional farmer who's using pesticides and herbicides and fungicides and the problem with all these acides is that they don't just kill off the pests they kill off all the beneficial bacteria and the beneficial fungi and the beneficial worms and all the creatures in the soil that are feeding your plants so it's really important that you want to have nice, healthy soil with lots of biology in it. Because all those creatures in the soil will eat all the organic matter, and turn it into carbon, and they are sequestering the carbon. So all those plants are sequestering carbon and taking carbon out of the air, putting it into the soil, and reducing the CO2 in the air. So that's a kind of fundamental understanding. So what are the methods we use to do that? How do we feed our microherds, as we call them, we farm our microherds. Well, first of all, we want to give them a balanced diet. We don't just want to give them, you know, uh, what do you call these? Grow fast or grow more or miracle grow, because that's basically saying, like, live on these vitamin tablets. And quite often, these things is a lot of the, the stuff, the nitrogen in there actually just sits in leaves and vacuoles, and it's not actually, it becomes toxic to people because it's con such a concentrated form. So, we make lots of natural compost, we make compost teas, we use mulch, which is any organic matter because that feeds the worms and all the bugs in the ground. We use nitrogen fixing plants. Um, so any legumes um, are usually fixed nitrogen. They take nitrogen out of the air and they have little nodules on their roots where the nitrogen builds up and that goes back into the soil via the fungi and the bacteria. And the same for dynamic accumulators. I mean, most people who've got an organic garden will have comfrey stashed away in there somewhere. Um, and we use comfrey, they just cut it and lay it down or cut it and make it into comfrey tea. Or even just plant it next to a fruit tree and it'll feed the fruit tree because, it, because it's got really deep tap roots. It gets access to lots of minerals that aren't on the surface. And it brings them up into its leaves and then you cut the leaves off and then that, those minerals become accessible to all the plants that soil live in. And we always practice no dig as well, because when you dig the soil, you let in too much air, which causes an explosion in aerobic bacteria. And then suddenly they've all multiplied and then there's no oxygen left and they all die out and it becomes anaerobic again. So we don't dig the soil. And also digging the soil breaks up the web of mycelium, the web of fungi that's feeding, feeding the plants. Um, so we want to give our soil a balanced diet. Um, and we protect our plants from pests and disease and drought and competitors. And we don't do that by adding chemicals. We do that by adding organic culture, organic matter, like wood chip and mulch and cardboard and even just compost. And we use polycultures, which I'll talk about in more in a minute, and companion planting, a bit of crop rotation. If anyone's a gardener, they're probably familiar with that. And we use heritage varieties because, you know, they, they're grown up in an area that they know and they know the weather and they, this is how they've evolved in the weather. Whereas when you use non-heritage varieties, um, they're, they're always quite vulnerable because there's a lot of pests they might not be used to because we've got them in from abroad. Um, you know, you, you, you can try and control the light and temperature by putting in wind breaks and frost protection and fleece and physical barriers. And for fertilization, obviously, you want to try and attack pollinators because you want them to do the work for you. Um, they're, they're part of your gardeners, everything gardens and pollinators garden and also wind pollination. Um, so when you put all that together, one thing that's very popular in permaculture gardens is forest gardening. Because actually bringing all of these things together. Um, 
And you know, if you're just growing annuals, generally speaking, you're limited to how much space you can grow things in because they take up a particular space. And the nice thing about a forest garden is you're growing up the way. So instead of just having two dimensions, you're growing in three dimensions. And suddenly you can pack, you know, 10 times, 20 times, maybe 100 times more plants into your garden because you're growing up the way as well as across the way. Um, I mean, a forest garden can have any number of layers. People, you know, there, there are seven possible layers. So there's a canopy layer, which are big, large fruit and nut trees like walnuts and um, hazelnuts are quite small, but you know, the, the big walnuts and honey locusts and things like that, which might be too big for your average back garden. Um, but below that, you have dwarf fruit trees. Um, so you can have apples and plums and pears, and they can be quite small, and that can be your canopy if you're going to be in a small back garden or a front garden even. And beneath that, right underneath that, you can have a shrub layer. So you can have currants and berries and raspberries, blueberries, any kind of sort of shrubby type of edible um, perennial. And below that, you've got a herbaceous layer. Um, you've got a ground cover layer, which is really important for weed suppression. And you've got a rhizosphere, which is basically root crops and a vertical layer. So you can also have climbers. You can climb vines up around your taller trees. So in this way, you're working in three dimensions and not just two dimensions. Um, so it's a very efficient way, a very space efficient way of growing things and everything works together. Um, and so when you expand on that, we always use polycultures. And again, this is why sometimes even organic farming isn't very optimum because they will still have a monoculture field of organic strawberries or organic raspberries or whatever. It's still a monoculture and it's still quite vulnerable to pesticides or to weather or to whatever. There's no resilience in there because it's only the one thing. And if one disease comes along that likes your raspberries, that's your entire crop wiped out. So we always try and build in, and grow in polycultures. And an example of that is this, is a guild. Um, and if you think about people, you know, people live in polycultures. You don't have a village with doctors and then another village somewhere over there that has mechanics and another village somewhere over there that has the farmers. You know, we all work together and everybody in our community has a different role and everybody contributes something different and everybody takes something away. And this is the same in your garden. And um, I mean, this little fruit guild here is a tiny little mini food forest and you can create a lot of them in your average back garden. And this system, you know, you're having lots of different trees, the taller ones will provide wind shelter for some of the other ones that would be more vulnerable to wind and frost. When you cover the entire surface with ground cover, edible ground cover plants, that suppresses the weeds, which is one less job to do. And I hate weeding, really hate weeding. Um, You've also got a mixture, you also plant things in there that are going to attract predatory insects like ladybirds and hoverflies and they all like to eat aphids. Um, and you want to attract pollinators in there, which the company is brilliant for, but any sort of flowering thing can be in there and attract pollinators. And you like, we like to confuse the pests. So I mean everybody's probably heard of carrot, carrot root fly. Um, if you grow it next to onions or anything else that's got a strong smell, then the carrots, the, the root fly can't smell the carrots. Um, we also have trap crops, like sacrificial crops. For example, nursum, nasturtiums attract the black fly, and if they're eating the nasturtiums, they're leaving your lettuce alone and other things alone. And we'd also stick in there some soil improvers, like nitrogen fixers and dynamic accumulators. And so everybody in this community is bringing something to the party and taking something else away. And under the ground in there, all of these plants are all linked together by the mycelium network. So it's basically, you know, we've got the internet above ground. Underground, you've got this world wide web of food sussling back and forward. And every plant is putting different nutrients into that food web and, and also taking different nutrients out. It's like a little super highway for nutrients shuttling around, um, feeding each other. And again, it's not just in one dimension. It's in three dimensions, so you can pack so much into that. And I do really recommend. Hey, um, I has, sorry, sorry, Carol. I just wanted to let you know that we are nearing at twenty minutes till um, five, which usually is when oh. when we sort of break out for questions. So, well, um, so just let you know, and you know, we can 
another five minutes and we can okay. hopefully give people a chance. And if you're having questions in your mind, it would be good if you started uh, typing them into the chat window right now so we can uh, gather them and summarize them um, at the end as well. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, and Helena, I think, gave a talk earlier in the plant series about perennial, perennial vegetables. Um, and I include lots of those, especially in a forest garden. They're great because it's a permanent system and you only plant them once and then you just keep harvesting and harvesting and harvesting. And you can plant them all flowered and fruit at different times of the year. So there'll always be something in the garden worth eating. Um, a lot less effort to grow than, than annuals and there's a lot less disturbance to the soil. So you're not disturbing that mycelium network. And you can chop and drop. So when you, you prune stuff, you don't have to take it away. You just chop it, leave the prunings on the ground and the bugs will come and eat them. And it's also very tasty. Um, um, very nutritious as well. I usually supplement them with some annuals, but the more perennials, the better. Um, and hugel culture beds is another way of catching and storing energy. And we plan to build one of these in the plants in the Tayport garden. And this is basically where you get all the material you might put into a compost heap, but you don't have to shred it all. You pile it up in layers and it becomes a deconstructed compost heap. It lasts a very long time, it absorbs moisture and holds it for a long time and also very slowly releases the nutrient as everything decomposes. So you never really have to feed it, um, which is another good tool to use. Um, if you're going to grow annuals, no dig all the way. Um, and I would recommend Charles Dowding videos to learn more about that. Basically, cover your soil with um, cardboard and compost and then plant into it. Um, that way you're protecting your mycelium network in the ground um, and if you use compost as a mulch you don't really have to do very much weeding. So I really recommend looking up Charles Dowding. Um, there's lots of different types of mulches but if you want to avoid slugs and snails then I would stick with just using compost as a mulch or on paths I would use wood chip. Um, heritage varieties are great because they've evolved in your local environment. They know the soil conditions, the climate. They've evolved with the pests and they're more likely to be pest resistant and disease resistant to your local pests. They need minimum might put. They're great for seed collection, whereas F1 hybrids, if you collect the seeds, odds are it's not going to grow what, you, what you're expecting. Um, and there's a few links on here if you're looking for heritage varieties for seeds. And so just to summarise, all of these little tools I kind of flew through a rate of knots. We're all about feeding the soil and feeding all the microorganisms in the soil so that your plants get a balanced diet. They're healthy, they're a lot more immune to um, disease and pests. And if they're healthy, then you're going to be a lot healthier as well. Um, and that's just some really good books. If you want to build a forest garden or do more about perennials in your garden, this is um, some really good books that you could start looking at. There you go, and some other useful links. I think Casca might put this on the on the website, and you'll be able to see all these links. So we can share these links on the website as well. Yeah, I um, just wanted to let everybody know that we will be putting the recording of this session online, obviously, and we'll include all the links as well. So um, and that nice lead reading list. So uh, I'm going to hand over to Helena now. Um, if you uh, Helena is, uh, works at the Nine Wills Community Garden and she's been involved with this gardening online series for a while um, and she's going to handle the Q&A part of the session so. Okay thank you um, so Susanna Silver you've got a question. Um, yeah. I, um, I would suggest perhaps Helena if we can read out the questions okay. rather than Go we normally it. ask people to ask their own questions but we have quite um, a lot of people and a lot of questions so let's just read out the questions and if people need to clarify they can unmute themselves um, okay okay so this this question is what is a swale that you mentioned at, near the beginning very good question um and so you ask sometimes and it um a swale is basically a trench that you want to dig on the contour of your land so that when the water so if you've got a hill um you want to dig a little a little trench and then the water will come into that trench and then it will soak, it will percolate through the ground. So 
So we never, ever thought we needed them in Scotland because we've never had a shortage of rain. Until the last four years, we've had a drought every single spring since I moved here. And we designed this, we didn't put swales in because we thought we didn't need them, but now we realise we really do. So if you're on a hill, it's a nice way, it's just like a little trench and it, you capture the water and it'll percolate through. Um, and you can also have a spillway in case it gets overfilled and you can, you can direct it down somewhere else. Um, it's a whole big topic to look up, but if you've got a very dry garden and you don't want to be there watering all the time, you can put in a swale and it'll harvest the water and let it dissipate through. Great, thank you. Um, we'll add the details about the permaculture course, I think, onto the um, email that goes out or the bottom of the, the blog that's um, going to go out. So, and there's also going to be a permaculture course happening um, with Carol at Plant Community Garden once we're safe to do that. So that's the all good yeah. information. Yes, we're coming up for a one day workshop. Um, and there's also, we're about to start uh, an online, a six week online course in September and you find the details on the non stuff page. Or you can also just do the first weekend as an introduction as well. So. Okay, thanks. Um, Shona was asking, how difficult would it be to manage um, this if, if their garden is next to a field which might be sprayed? Well, funnily enough, I have that same thing. So. My site is part of, used to be part of the farm that's across the road and, and we have half the field and the other half of the field is still the farmers. So it's worth asking your farmer what they do spray. And in Scotland, they don't spray an awful lot. So my farmer will only spray urea and fungicides. Little does he know I actually breed mushrooms here. <laughs> so don't tell him. But um, what we've done is we've just put up uh, a hedge. We planted a hedge along that boundary wall with a, just a, a variety of things that feed the wildlife, could also feed us. Um, and then that way there's, there's quite a, a big root system down there that might pick up anything that would run into here. And it also depends if you're uphill or downhill of the farmer. Um, but we put up a hedge just to try and block any kind of spraying stuff. Um, but it's worth asking the farmer what he does spray because it's, in Scotland they don't spray that much actually. Although maybe if you're up in and the fruit growing area they do, I'm not sure. But down here, our farmers don't spray that much. It's worth asking them. Okay, thanks. Um, Epi's wondering if you have a wormery? I or don't, but it's one of the things we normally make on the permaculture course. Um, <laughs> I don't personally have one. Um, you can get like plastic ones, you can make wooden ones. Um, it's something we do do usually in the first couple of weekends on the permaculture courses, we actually physically make wormeries um, and teach people how to do that on the introduction course. They're very easy. To, it's basically you just make a wooden box um, and fill it with some compost and put your, your food scraps in it. And so long as there's air and drainage, your worms will be okay. They, they prefer wood than plastic, because plastic they can't really breathe. Um, they're more prone to die in the plastic ones. And is that with native worms or like worms that you buy online? If you have a compost, if you just build a compost pile in your garden, worms will appear. It's like build it and they will come. Um, they will come up, they will find the food and they will come up and then just grab a handful and chuck them in your wormery. <laughs> um, okay, the next question that Robert was asking is how productive is the food garden bearing in mind all the wildlife around? Ah, yes. Well, I'm glad you asked that. Um, we have a problem with deer in our garden. So because we're, we're obviously in the country and we need bigger fences for the deer. The whole thing with permaculture is if you, you want to have, you're growing in abundance, you want to have enough for the wildlife and for you. So the birds do tend to steal a few berries. But going back to this hedge I have along the boundary wall, that hedge is full of berberis and cotoneaster and lots of other stuff that birds like to eat. And I'm hoping they'll eat that and they'll leave my berries alone. Um, my biggest problem is deer. So it a lot depends on who your wildlife is and what you do. I mean, you can put netting over, but the nice thing about a forest garden in your garden is that there's so much stuff there, a lot of it's hidden. You know, you would need a whole, I mean, we've got a big plague of crows at the moment and even they can't eat everything I have in my garden. Um, so, and if, if it's annuals, I, I net all my annuals because they're too obvious, um, you know, that the birds can see them and they'll come, especially brassicas. So I always net brassicas. Um, 
because the, the pigeons just really love brassicas and the deer really love everything else. So that's pretty much what I would say. And, and for snails and slugs, it's have, we have tiny little ponds dotted about. I mean, I just use like an old, an old bathroom sink or an old kitchen sink or an old shower tray. It doesn't have to be big. Even a container pond and a flower pot will attract enough frogs and hedgehogs to try and keep down some of the, the slugs and the snails and things like that. Um, Laura was the next question, but the, you can get a copy of the slides if, if you have a look at the um, the video that gets put up later. Um, right, so Bob, that was you again asking, um, does it help to sink carbon into the soil as well as helping plant growth, per, does permaculture? Soil is a huge carbon sequestration thing, and that's another advantage of perennials over annuals, is, is they're quite woody and they get quite big. And so they are taking a lot more CO2 out of the air, which is going down into the roots. So you are sequestering soil into the plant, but also you're building up your soil. And the things with perennials is they, they drop their leaves in the winter and that feeds the soil. And it's just all that carbon goes back in the soil. So growing soil is sequestering carbon. Um, I mean, trees, trees do everything. They, they, they sequester carbon, they feed the soil, they grow food. All of the things that are wrong with our planet cannot be fixed, could, you know, could all be fixed by planting enough trees. And if you plant edible ones, then you fix the whole food problem as well. So I am a bit passionate about trees. <laughs> uh, thanks. Laura's asking, does this system work for elevated raised beds? Um, I, I sort of, most people use elevated raised beds because they don't want to bend down. You can grow anything in an elevated raised bed, um, anything you want really. Most I tend to grow shrubs. I mean, a forest garden you wouldn't have in a, in a raised bed because, you know, they're, they're quite big things. Um, I would tend to put annuals in a raised bed, but you can do all no dig, and obviously you would do no dig in a raised bed. Um, but you could grow a lot of ground cover and um, herbaceous layer, and probably depends how big your shrub layer was. I wouldn't go any bigger than that in a raised bed. I don't think. Thanks. Jessie's asking, um, I have a very small area with three old fruit trees under underplanted with black currants and gooseberries. The mm -hmm. soft fruit don't do very well. They don't get much light through the trees. Is it just too tight planting? It might be. This is you kind of want in Scotland particularly, you want an open canopy. So even in my sort of my big field, when we're planting our trees, they're quite far apart to make sure the light's getting through them. And this is why you have to go back to the design stage. This is why I started off with permaculture as a design system. So where you plant, you, you could probably have those trees, but you have to plant them so that they're at the back, you know, they're towards the north or at the top of the hill and the smaller stuff in front of them. If you imagine going back to school and you're, you're doing your class photo and all the tall, tall folk are at the back, and it's the same when you're designing your garden. You want to look at what each plant needs and create a little microclimate and see how that's going to fit into your guild. So it's great to have those trees. Now you can maybe prune them back and thin them out so that the light's coming through the canopy and the other stuff. But the other thing you could do is grow stuff that um, will fruit in the spring underneath the things that are going to be in leaf later on. Um, or things that are going to, you know, once the leaves have fallen, they might be fruiting, they might need to ripen. And you also want, depending on what it is, like gooseberries like a bit of wind through there, they don't, they can get a bit mildewy if there's not enough air floating about them. Um, some people grow gooseberries as a standard so that they're upright and then you can grow lower layers underneath them. Um, and again, that's another way of bringing things up tall so that you can grow other things underneath them and bringing them up to the light as well. So if you look at your garden and have to look, see where, where's the sun coming from? And is it a way, do I need to move these dwarf trees I mean, if, you know, if I can move them, move them in the winter time, and I move them and then put the smaller stuff so that they are actually getting the light and the fruit trees not shading the night. So it all goes back to design. Permaculture is a design system more than anything else. Okay, um, someone's asking, how do you produce enough compost to start a no-dig bed? The eternal question. <laughs> well, into it. I've got a friend called Kate. Um, if you're on Facebook, look up Gardening the Woods. Um, she's an amazing woman. Um, so what she does is she just, just creates bed and then throws all her stuff into it and lets it compost in situ and then the following year she'll grow in it. Um, for me to start with, um, I had to buy in compost. 
Um, and most people, I think, have to buy in compost at the start. Um, unless you're very, very good at hot composting and you keep mowing your grass. And what, what, what you can do is if you have a, a friendly tree surgeon, get them to drop off a big load of wood chip and leave it to compost itself. Now, because we've got five acres, we get deliveries of wood chip from the tree surgeon every week because they need to pay to get rid of it. Um, and they want, they want to get rid of it for free. So we get a big load of wood chip, and if you give it a year or maybe two, it'll, decom it'll just decompose itself and turn into nice compost. But if you mix it with your grass clippings, it'll go a lot faster. The more effort you put into compost, the quicker you get a result. I don't have the time or energy, to be honest with you. And some people just love spending hours with compost heap and turning it. Um, and I get satisfaction out of that, but it just takes me, it takes time away from other things. You can, you can actually put tubes um, that have got whole air, like holes drilled into them, into your compost pile that will let air into it, and you don't have to turn it as much. So there are various different, people have got lots of ideas of how you don't have to turn compost, but the more you turn it, the quicker it's going to go, and then you can get more of it to fill your beds. But, um, yeah, you, it won't just materialise out, materialize out of nowhere. Okay, thank you. Um, the other thing I guess you could do is just start small and just do as much as you've got the compost for and then just add to it yeah, every year. Do one by that time. Yeah. Um, so are there ornamental plants, not just edible plant ones that could be part of the guild and how would you find out? You can mention yeah. that. Whatever you want. You know, it's funny people say, oh, I really like magnolias, but oh, they can't eat them so I can't have them in my garden. No, being beautiful is a good enough excuse to have something in your garden. Do you know what I mean? I mean, this is the thing about permaculture. It's not just earth care, it's people care and bear share. And the thing about a forest garden is it should be beautiful. I mean, if you watch Nenya's video and Graham Bell's videos, they're stunning. Um, I have magnolias in my garden. You can put ornamentals in, and because the ornamentals as well as being beautiful, they will be doing something for your garden that you don't necessarily know. They'll be feeding something, they'll be attracting pollinators, they'll be doing something. Um, you know, the gar the, the, your garden is still your garden to do, and it should be meeting your needs, not the needs of a book on permaculture. Um, so you have beautiful things in it. Excellent. Um, there was just a follow up from the um, wood chip one. Is are conifer wood chips any good for growing? If you, if well, if you're trying to make your ground more acidic, yes. If you don't want it to be acidic, then no. <laughs> If you mix it in with other stuff, to be honest, if I put things in the compost heap, it all just mixes in together and I think it all sorts itself out. Um, we, I, have, I have acidic grind anyway because I have um, clay and clay, I've got heavy clay acidic soil. Um, and any kind of, if you put any organic matter onto it, the, the, the worms and the, the biology sorts itself out. And in our wetlands here, we, we are using wetlands to treat ammonia and the plants, generally speaking, will change the pH of the soil to suit themselves, and, or, and the water to suit themselves. So we put ammonia in there, which is like pH 10, pH 11. And by the time it, the water comes out the other side, it's down to pH 7, because the plants have changed it to make it an environment that they're happy with. So I don't worry too much about conifer wood chips. I, I use anything and everything, so long as I mix it in with other stuff. Um, I wouldn't put them around something that only wanted to be in a lime environment. Um, again, just check the needs of your plant and design that accordingly. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'm just pointing out we've got uh, just just four minutes to now. Um, okay, so we've had one uh, last question, I think, that's here. There's a few comments, a lot of people asking for um, copies of the slides, but this um, whole thing will be, the film, the recording will be online and Kashka, you email it out to everyone that was signed up for this, don't you? So that's that's all good. You can get this information all again um, later. So how do you grow potatoes using the no dig method? Well I've done um, and this is quite good if you're breaking new ground is basically I just put a layer of cardboard and just lay the potato on it and then just put um, you know a spade full of compost on the top and then just keep earthing it up over the top and then when it comes to the end of it because the compost is so loose you just pull your potato plant out and most of the potatoes come out anyway. And I might stick my hands in and grab a few more. Um, but I don't tend to use a fork to, to pull them up because I end up putting a fork through them. And you know, if you're just putting more compost on the top, and again, it goes back to where do you get all this magic compost from? Um, 
we buy it, you can buy it in bulk from Caledonian horticulture um, and it's kind of municipal compost. So it's maybe not as rich as this stuff in the plastic bags, but it's a lot cheaper. And if you're working in bulk for potatoes, then it's probably good enough. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think that's us at the end of the questions. If anyone's got any that I missed while um, scrolling through, now would be a good time to comment. No, and I think that's us finishing bang on time then. <laughs> that's amazing. Thank you, everybody. Um, Thanks for everything. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us, and I hope that was help, uh, helpful. And as we've mentioned a, f a few times, we um, we putting this uh, presentation online, uh, the recording from it, and we'll link in any of the resources that were in the slides as well, and information about the upcoming courses. Um, Carol, if you can send me the ones that you're going to be running from your um, place as well. Um, another thing that we will um, be doing shortly, I'm not sure when, maybe in August, is screening uh, a, permaco a movie which is called Inhabit. And, it talk, uh, and it's, uh, I've just watched it and it's really quite an inspiring movie about a pro um, how to use permaculture uh, at different scales in different uh, contexts um to you know grow communities as well as growing food uh, and it's based in the us it's quite a, a lovely illustration of, perma of what permaculture can uh, produce uh, and achieve so uh, this will be advertised on our um, facebook page and on our um, uh, website which is tapeordgarden.org uh, and it's going to be an online event, so perfectly socially distanced. Um, and hopefully we can have lots and lots of people join in into the discussion as well as watching the movie. Um, so just wanted to tell people about that. Uh, right. Thank you so much for um, joining us. That was uh, <laughs> my husband trying to be really lovely. Uh, lovely cherries delivered specially for me. <laughs> Um, right, perhaps slightly prematurely, <laughs> but um, thank you again, everybody, for joining, and thank you for Carol for such an inspiring talk. Uh, obviously, it was just touching; um, uh, the, it's a tip of the iceberg about the whole approach. But hopefully, we can organise some other sessions and, and um, experiences for people to explore it further. So, I just wanted to do our um, uh, usual. Um, um, big wave. So if you uh, want to um, activate your camera and just do a big wave to say goodbye to everybody at the end of the session. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much for having Thank me. You. Thank you. It was great. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you.